Well, good morning, guys, and welcome to the show. How's everybody doing today? Fernando. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Ah, oh, wonderful, man. You excited about working on this F-150? Yes. Yes, I am. And the reason why he's just trying to contain himself with excitement is because this is one of your guys' favorite. This is a 911. Oh, yeah. This is somebody that, well, he paid for something. He didn't get what he paid for. So it's in here today for two reasons. One, to fix all of that, and two, for technology upgrade. I'll explain what that is, but let's get through this intro, and I'll see you on the other side. We know how much you guys absolutely love 911s, right, Fernando? Correct. You guys tell us, like, anytime we're on the internets that, oh man, we love the 911s. And I personally hate them because I, I hate knowing that somebody paid for something and didn't get what they want. It right. kind of is what we do for a living. Yeah. And when somebody does a sucky job, it really kind of pulls out our heartstrings. And of course, it encourages us to, when we get our hands on it finally, to make sure that everything we go through with a fine tooth comb and make sure that it's, it's the way it's supposed to be. We're going to take you on that journey all the way through that. The first thing we have to do, like if you're, if you're in a position where you're going to have to fix something for you, your body, whatever. First thing, the first, the very first step, if you have amplifiers, is to disconnect them from the battery because you're going to be going down a rabbit hole and you might forget. You're just going to get carried away into it and just discovery, as I like to call the archaeology of the 911. So that's where we'll start on this one. We have this four gauge wire here and we have this eight gauge wire here. Let's talk about, for a brief second, you can go ahead and cut them, the positives and negatives of this installation. We have an eight gauge wire here, which I'm assuming goes to the smaller of the two amplifiers. It is going through the grommet, so it's not pinched in the metal, but there is no waterproofing on it. Now, whether you decide to put tech flex or loom or anything like that, the reality is, is that the shield on the wire is the strength. This is an extra protectant that could protect it from anything happening in the engine compartment. This doesn't have any, as you can see, every other wire in here does, so that's why we do it. Protection and also to blend so it doesn't look like this cheap thing. The simple fix on this is, for one, figure out a way to mount this fuse, because zip tying it to the main power harness, not the best. And two, cover it in something, fill the hole. Let's look at the other wire. Now the four gauge does come across here, which is nice because that's what we do. But as you can see, as it comes out over here, there is nothing covering this wire. Well, it had it there, but it doesn't have it here. That is a result of the way most power wire companies cover their kits. They give you, for some reason, a very small amount of TechFlex that covers just where it would be coming through the engine compartment. Kind of like if it was that eight gauge and where it had came through, then it would be wonderful and we wouldn't be having this conversation. But it isn't. It's something I don't like. I wish manufacturers would cover the wire. Now, there are some that do now. Metro does that with their kits. Yep. That's yep. uh, fully sleeved. We fully sleeve our wiring. Just something to consider. It does come through the main grommet over here. It is coming through the rubber part. It's not pushed out or anything like that. However, there again, it's just a slit and there is no insulation on it. Why that could be important, because if you look over here on the floor, you see this water stain? I'm not saying it's because of that. However, that's usually what happens. As we live in Florida, there's tons of rain, there's tons of water. If you've even driven on a, a wet road with a puddle, it's gonna get into this and it's gonna get into the car and it's gonna make the car stink. We use 3M strip caulk. However, there's a ton of stuff, some silicone on a finger, rub it in the hole, do whatever you need. But you need to make sure you waterproof that hole so that whatever's happening here in the engine bay does not get into the carpet inside the car. To be a 911, it has to be more than, let's just say, some janky power wire because that, let's be honest, that's, that's most cars out there. You, people just don't think, oh, I need brackets to mount the fuse holders and stuff like that. Oh, it's perfectly acceptable if I put a zip tie to hold the wire in. Whatever turns you on, it's not. So this is one of those monologue times where it's, I'm gonna explain to you why it is here and what the original plan was. So this gentleman, 
got a really good deal on a set of Focal K2 components and an amazing deal on some flax. And he was like, that is cool. I'm gonna have the K2s put in the front, as you naturally would. I'm gonna have the flax put in the back. He needed an amplifier to power him, so we took him to his local Focal dealer. They sell him a Focal amp. He's all excited. He's got two subs underneath the back seat, which we'll take a look at. And he's like, this is gonna be awesome. When he got it back, not so much. So, this is the K2 tweeter. And as you can see, it's mounted in the back door. That means that the flax tweeter is mounted in the front. Now, if you guys have followed the channel, you're probably familiar with what their passive crossovers look like. We've talked about them, we've shown them, but if not, you'll see them in this video. According to him, the flax tweeters are mounted in the back door, and he only assumes that because for a long time, the passenger rear window wouldn't roll down all the way. Finally, he knocked it loose, and it does roll down all the way now, so that ought to be interesting to see what that looks like. And then they told him that they mounted the K2 crossovers behind the radio. And as you can see, there's a gap here, no gap here. Uh, okay, so cool, it's just looking pretty janky as far as that goes. This is the technology upgrade we're going to do. It has an older radio in it that doesn't have all the best features. And also we want better sound quality. So we're going to upgrade to this Kenwood right here. We'll come back to that. As far as the two amplifiers go, they're mounted underneath these two front seats. I didn't want to look at those yet. We've disconnected the power. The first step is we're going to get this radio out of the dash and see what's going behind there. I want to check and see if those crossovers are there. Then we'll start getting the doors off. Then we'll get the seats out. And we're going to take you guys along on the discovery portion of this where we figure out what the heck is actually going on in here. Then we'll go through and fix it all. Sound like a plan? Brando? Sounds like a plan. Let's get this radio out of the dash, figure out what's going on behind it. The first step of getting this radio out of this car is this is a rubber piece here. We're gonna pull up on that. Behind that is two seven millimeter screws. Down low where you see it says Microsoft Sync, this panel is designed to pop out. Now it can be tricky. The older the car is, the more likelihood of it not coming out the way we want it to happens. Just gently start prying. Eventually it'll pop out. On the back side, you can see these clips here along the top and bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Come at it from the end instead of the top, that's what causes these to break. There's this clip here on the passenger side, so if you kind of come in here and push a little bit, this will pop off and it won't do anything. The customer has told us this doesn't work, meaning the factory USB doesn't do anything. I believe there's USBs located in the glove box that of course is filled with all kinds of fun and excitement. There's a seven millimeter screw behind here, you want to remove that now this is where the fun comes in this kit actually snugs in behind these panels here so to get those loose start at the bottom and just kind of pry up a little bit on them and do the same on the other side if you have the center console version of this you may have to remove a lot more this one is kind of easy pull this forward from the top and bottom do a little shake left and right it'll come out disconnect all the harnesses on the back, your airbag, your cigarette lighter, your air conditioner. You don't have to worry about the airbag triggering anything in this car. And set that aside. Oh goody! Zoom in on that. So there's what we have located behind the dash. We know these cars' dashes are getting tighter and tighter and harder and harder to work on. And the more stuff that the factory puts in there, the harder and harder it is to get what you need in there. And that's why putting like giant passive crossovers behind the radio really doesn't seem like that great of an idea. But we'll start pulling this out and see what we got going on. To get the radio out, there are four seven millimeter screws located towards the back, to which this has three. Pull the radio forward. All right. So, before you start unplugging things, if you're gonna be keeping the RCAs you're using, make sure they're labeled. In this case, we're not. It looks like it's using kicker RCAs here for the highs. Something else different. Metra. Oh, Metra. For the sub, the antenna, power, USB, steering wheel control, microphone, and line level input. That's different. Okay, so we got a lot of stuff going on. And here are those two passive crossovers. They did use Tessa tape to tape up a whole bunch of stuff. I'm guessing this is what goes underneath the front seat. Wow, this must have been fun trying to get these crossovers in here because these are the crossovers. Like, you have to pull these four screws off and you have to really build these crossovers. For now, we're just going to get some cutters, just trim these up, get them out of the dash. And 
then the next thing, remove the power plug. This does have a Metro steering wheel adapter. We need to open the glow box and figure out what's, what's going over into that. All right, here we go. We have a subwoofer level control that they installed. These are just two short RCA. Oh no, this is just a short RCA. This goes off to a Stinger 4000. And then to remove the glow box, which has got us the aux cable and the USB out. And we have this guy here. Let me see your cutters for a second. I'm using a T-tap to attach the power and ground for the steering wheel controls. Leave those right where they're at for now. We're changing brands of radio, so that'll have to change. And then down here on the harness, here's the remote turn on for these RCAs. This, ooh, look, butt connector, butt connector. It's so we have a relay. Emergency brake? No, because it's got a TR7 for the bypass. It's got a power, an accessory, and a ground, and then it goes. I believe this is powering the accessory. I think this is probably going off to the fuse box and turning on this accessory. Betcha this is a smart harness, and they didn't sell him a smart harness. Yeah, right here. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, so the red wire is not connected. Instead of selling him the right harness, they that means that this top fuse. controller doesn't work. Oh, wow. So they just tap the fuse over in the fuse box to turn the thing on. Listen, if you want to be cheap, that's cool, but the reality is is that, I mean, they sold him a steering wheel control. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll have to talk to him about that. Well, Fernando pulls the fuse box apart and sees what that looks like so we can remove that wire. We don't want this just chilling out in here. That's definitely not how it's going to end up in the end. This is the harness. A lot of these cars nowadays need some kind of a smart interface to turn on the radio and also it just does a lot for the car. It's talking with the car, telling it what to do. So not putting something like that back in is a bad idea. This car, there's several interfaces that you can use with it. Everybody makes one now. We'll probably get him to go with the iData interface because this has a top screen in it located right here. And when you use the iData interface, it retains that top screen and all of its functionality. So it'll tell you the radio stations you're on and all that other fun stuff. Plus you don't know what that circuit is that they've tapped into. You also lose things like wrap, retained accessory power. So we can turn off the key, open the door, that kind of thing, which are features a lot of people like. All right, he's having fun over there, as you can see. It's, uh, yeah, who knows where they found the wire. While he's over there doing that, I'm gonna get this Bluetooth mic out. In order to do that, I need to remove this A-pillar. On this car, it is simple enough. Pull the rubber gasket out, put your hand in there, and it will come loose, and you can get your microphone out. Now, there are some airbag safe clips on this. It looks like they had a good time screwing with. Very nice. And that's gonna take me a minute to get past that, but Fernando's got that area of parts. Let's go take a look at that, and I'll come back to that airbag <laughs> safe clip. So over here in the side, we have another TR7, okay. And we have a couple T-taps that are put in. This goes off to our wire and back to our wire back there. Some more T-taps. Some random T-taps here. Those could have been from a previous install. Who the heck knows? We have all this going on. So this is probably a situation where somebody was trying to be smarter than they needed to be, creating some fun circuit with the TR7. So maybe trying to give them retained accessory power, wrap, as we said, so that you, which you can do with the TR7. You can like, when it loses power, it stays on for a minute or two or something like that. I don't know. I'm not even gonna try to figure out what they did with that. However, now that we found these five T-tap points, we have to go in and we have to fix this. This is the joys of 911. When a T-tap cuts onto the wire, or cuts onto the wire, when a T-tap attaches to the wire, it can cut it. It also creates a corrosion point because you've removed the shield around the wire. We're gonna have to fix all this creative crap that these guys did in order to move forward for the next 20 minutes. Fernando's gonna be over there cutting, soldering, getting everything back to as, as close to not screwed up as possible. And I'm gonna return to this A pillar. Now most of the time in these F-150s, this A pillar is just gonna like pop right off with no issues. Not so much on this one. Oh, and they've made this speaker wire so tight that this A pillar doesn't come out. A silicone in the tweeter. We'll take a closer look at the tweeter once we get over to the bench with it. Figure out how we're gonna put this bigger tweeter in there. 
Now, if you are gonna put a new tweeter or something like this on the eight pillar, make sure you put some form of a serviceability point so that if this has to go back to the dealer or to a mechanic or you just wanna get over here for whatever reason, you can remove the whole speaker without like having to cut the wire. Now, there are two butt connectors located over here but that's not gonna do me any good. Try to get out the microphone. I ended up having to take a little bit more of the dash apart. And what that means is removing the cover of the gauge cluster. There's two seven millimeters here and this comes off and then fully removing this whole side. Once this comes off, that comes off very easily. And then removing the knee buster here, which there's three sevens to get the plastic off and four tens to get this piece of metal off. And that allowed me to get the RCAs and the mic wire through this area here it was kind of wrapped around and all kinds of fun stuff but I did find this and this brings me to one of my pet peeves I'm all for taping up the wire the way they did here that's cool but what I don't like is the remote turn on getting taped up into the wire there's no need for it I, I can't do it like this and there again I know why they put it over here because as we saw there was no room in the dash so they just probably pulled it all over here and bundled it up if I have to bundle up on RCA it is not going to have the remote turn on wire in it I'm going to remove it I'm going to redo this piece here so that it is the way it's supposed to be now, this is one of those other funny things is you did the half wrap all the way through here, but then behind the radio where no one is actually gonna see it, you did the full wrap. That to me is kind of counterproductive because no one is actually ever gonna see this Whereas leaning up underneath the dash, they're gonna see this. So this, if you're trying to just keep the wire together in a group, half wrap is cool. But if you're trying to blend the wire in with the factory, then you wanna do a full wrap where people are actually going to see it. When you do a half wrap like this, this is more or less for keeping the bundle of wire together. It's not wrong. And that comes down to system planning. If you just wanna use the tape as a bundle maker, then do a half wrap. If you wanna use the tape as an, a full insulator, then make sure you do a full wrap. That's one of those things people will debate about. Ooh, love it. Fernando's still over there soldering that all back together. It's gonna to take them a couple minutes. Next, I'm going to pull up the floorboard and let's, we'll see what this amplifier install looks like. Running board is off. The sub RCN remote turned on. Looks like they came down around this way and they're going all the way across the floor and underneath this. The sub amp is underneath the passenger seat. Underneath the driver's seat is the highs amp. And if we look at it here from the front, we can kind of get an idea kind of chilling out back there. There's your power wire, ground wire, and two big zip ties. Sliding the seat forward and looking at it from the back side. Okay, something that you don't wanna do is tuck the RCAs underneath the amplifier and screw the amplifier down. Now clearly I've been doing this a really long time. Sorry about that. This is something that has started and been going on for a long time. Why you would screw an amplifier on top of the RCAs, or any of the wires for that matter. It's one of those things I've seen over and over again. For me, I don't understand it because willingly pinching the RCAs underneath the amplifier, I don't get it. The heat. Everything, it's just silly. I could see saying this to somebody and then they would reply back, well dude, it's foam, so the RCA is you know, pushing down into the foam because the amp is hard, it's like, what? That doesn't even make sense. If you're gonna be doing some kind of an amp install, don't screw the amp on top of the RCAs. And I know some of you out there have done it before and you're like, yeah, yeah it seemed like a good idea at the time. And a lot of times I can, I can see that, but we're better than that now, so let's not do that. The other thing too is there's no amp rack holding this thing in place. It's just screwed into the rubber mat. Focal uses an extremely long screw to go in through the top, which is an Allen that comes in the box. This is a small four channel. This is the FPX. 4.800 4 channel. It's a freaking awesome amplifier. It's just been done dirty. I'm gonna get it out. I have the amplifier out, pulled all the wiring out, got everything back to where it needs to be, removed the ground. The ground was located right here and they had sanded away all the paint and there was a couple holes. I covered them up with sound treatment. I couldn't get to them from the backside, which is what I normally like to do. But when I did crawl underneath the truck, Oddly enough, there, I saw daylight. There was a couple holes that looked like underneath the seat that had clips or something, and they pulled all those out. So I put sound treatment over those holes so that no water would be, no more water, I should say, would be coming up through there. So there was a hole open.
open up underneath the seat that water was definitely going to be getting into joy this is still over here but fernando informs me that he's done soldering that back together now we can get over there take a look how many wires did you end up soldering together five six five or six yeah that's what uh, it looked like yeah so the easiest thing for us to do is these two were speaker wires four of them were speaker wires those were easy enough to cut solder back together and put heat shrink over there was some other wires that we didn't know what they were we wanted to solder those back together one of them was kind of short so we ended up putting an extension in it the last step will be to put some tape over them to make them look like the factory harness again they use sticky black tape we'll put some sticky black tape on there we won't put tessa tape if they're using sticky black tape on the factory wiring we'll use sticky black tape on the factory wiring to put that all back together and then can go into the pile of garbage he has removed the running board obviously to get to that the other amplifier is located up underneath this seat we got our big ground wire oh it, it pulled right out i wonder what that was attached to looks like an alpine and it is an alpine oh this is different we had that silver wire that was a ground but this is using an eight gauge black wire as a ground this is just sitting chilling out same way the other one was removing the two screws from the rubber it easily comes out pulling this forward a little bit alpine uses phillips screws as tempting as it is to use a drill because you have it in your hand don't do it switch to the screwdriver now the other thing is because it was screwed in now these screws are stuck in here be careful what you set this on you don't want this screw to poke a hole into anything over here on the side there is that four gauge ground and there is the 80 gauge ground apparently it was too hard to remove that you can already see rust coming in i'll do the same thing i did on that side is i'll get it all off clean off the surface rust i'll put some insulation on this side if i can get to it on the other side i will also i was able to get treatment on both sides front and back luckily the amplifiers weren't screwed through the floor so i didn't have to cover those up now let's look at the door fernando got both of the door panels off boy the hits keep rolling this is a set of k2s in the front door I don't, I don't really even know how to describe what i'm looking at apparently this is our fast ring maybe and then this is some foam sound shield sound treatment that is covering up the speaker i'll have to get all of this off and hopefully get the speaker out hopefully the speaker is not damaged because that would be heartbreaking at this point we're not planning for a damaged speaker but this is what this looks like if you do this you're an idiot that's the only thing i can say there's absolutely no reason to do that in a door of a car anywhere it's like the dumbest thing let's take a look at what's going on here in the back there again no way to remove the tweeter just butt connected that's that's joy it's really good are we surprised at this point? Yeah, Twitter is coming out. Yeah, See. yeah, that's okay. We're we're gonna put it where it belongs, hopefully. And then if we move on down, hold that for a second. Tried to use some fast strings. They even cut them, but they still did a crappy job on them. So this is a six by nine spacer. This is not a six by nine inch hole. Let's get this speaker out. So we got a drywall screw on the bottom, and then two. So there's three different, so these two screws match, this screw doesn't match. Go careful. So these are the screws we use to put the speakers in the door. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, here's the acoustic plug jammed way over here into the side and just stuck to something. Cool. Oh, what the hell? Why is that bent like that? That doesn't, that's weird. Oh, they soldered it on. Oh, they booger soldered it too. They didn't even do a good job. Wow, that means that got really hot. That's bad. Found the passive crossover. It's being held in by a giant zip tie. And here we go. We have the crossover. This was mounted inside of the water vapor barrier. So that means that this got wet. If you're gonna mount it in the door, which isn't the end of the world, you wanna make sure that you do it on this side, somewhere here between this and the door panel not behind here where it's exposed to all the elements. Any corrosion? I don't know, I'll take it apart later and we'll check it out. It's just gross, it's just like all kinds of sticky crap all over it. All right, that leaves us with getting this speaker out, which is clearly gonna take a little bit more time. We also need to roll these windows back up because he said he had sound treatment in here and I really need to see where it's at before I give him a call and suggest we do more. But this is the sound treatment that he had. It could be the sound That's treatment it. that he had. Like they say, we're going to put sound treatment in your speaker. Like literally, on your speaker. This is not good, man. Come on. Sound treatment, it's mess around. 
So in this particular Ford, it's a five by seven and not a six by nine. We've done Focal K2s in this F-150 and there are a couple things that are special about it. This is, this is fun. So this is actually a seven oh, inch. Seven. No, no, these are all, these are not, those are all six this by nines. Seven inch. But this is the seven inch Kenwood adapter. Yeah. Not a six and a half. And this is just the generic six by nine adapter. So they did that to create a spacer. And I think we figured out why they had the sound treatment on the front of this. And that is because if you don't properly install these, the speaker will actually hit the door panel because you have to remove plastic from the door panel. I know we have a video out there that we've done where we show you how to actually trim out the door panel. And what I mean is this door panel here, this metal piece comes off and you have to trim this area out so the speaker doesn't hit it. Thinking that's why they put all that sound treatment on the front was to space out the door panel some so that that didn't hit. The other thing they did is they didn't trim the back fast string. This line that you're looking at is from the window going up and down over the top of the fast string. They needed to cut like an inch off of the surface of that so that it wouldn't do that. As I said, there's supposed to be sound treatment in here. Do you see any? They have Oh, there's some. Back, I, I see some back here. Yeah. Yeah, there's some sound shield there. So believe it or not, this isn't the worst one that we've seen. This is funny though, because what we've started to see happening is that these 911s are, are getting more advanced, meaning that they're using some of the proper techniques, like they fully insulate some of the wires, then they don't insulate some of the wires. And it, it's like they're they're trying, but they're still falling so short. Like this, the hell is this? No, and, I, I disagree. For me, it's, you can have all the tools. But if you do it wrong, it's still wrong. It doesn't matter. It is wrong, but I feel like they're, there's, they're like using some techniques to do it wrong. Like, for example. They have, they have the tools. Right? They have the tools. They're just falling short. But they're short. still doing it wrong. So it's like, yeah. dude. It's kind of weird. Yeah. I don't, I don't like it. Either way, this is what we've got. Now to give you guys a reference point, like if you're ever here and you want us to do something like this, we've been working on this now for about two and a half hours to get to this point where we have almost the whole car apart. We still have the passenger side that we have to give apart and we have to hop over to the bench and we're gonna clean all these things up so that we can reuse them. Cause right now they're not in a usable state. We still have sticky goo all over the speakers and we'll get to that. But the last thing that we need to get out of the car other than the other door, like I said, is the subwoofer enclosure. He likes the base that this has and so we're gonna leave it as far as that goes. It is kind of big and it kind of sticks out. He wanted 212 so that's why the 212s do stick out. Apparently the jack is just laying on the floor behind the box. These are tens, but he thought he had 12. I know they're tens, but my eyes might be playing tricks on me. There's no way. <laughs> I'm just saying, I was like, he said 12. These are definitely not 12. All right, so he thought he had a 212 box and he has a 210 box. This one you think it can't get more amusing. All right, the reason why I wanted to get the sub box out, for one, I needed to pull the wire that was going up to the sub amp underneath the passenger seat. Now, let's talk about the future of this truck and what we're gonna do. First thing we're gonna do is clean up all the stuff that we've taken out, obviously. Fernando's already fixed the wiring on this side. There is some wiring behind the radio because it has a steering wheel control module in there that's gonna be coming out. I also need to go next door and call the customer and break him the news of what we found out. After we get that done, then it's going to be starting to figure out what we're gonna do for installation. The amplifiers, the crossovers, all that fun stuff are gonna go behind the back seat. So we'll be pulling out the back seat and building an amp rack for back there. There's room for that kind of stuff. We'll be running a power distribution system in here. So it might be a zero gauge, haven't really decided yet. Might be two four gauge, don't know. It might be one four gauge because Honestly, these two amplifiers are kind of small and we don't really need a big power wire. His power wire is too short. We're not gonna be reusing any of that stuff. All his stuff is in a nice bundle in the bed of the truck. That's where we're at. That means it's time to just get going. So let's head over to the bench and we'll take a closer look at the stuff that we just took out and what we're gonna need to do to get it ready to go back into the car properly. For a sub amp, we're gonna be using this, which is the Alpine. MRV M500. It's a little 500 watt sub amp. The way these brackets attach, they snap in place like this and go over the screw down mounts and the RCAs and all those 
speaker connectors, power connection, stuff like this. 60 amp current draw. It's a nice little lamp, extremely reliable. This will do just fine as it's been doing on those two Scar Audio 10 inch drivers. Powering the speakers, it's gonna be this, the FPX 4.800 D-Class Focal Amplifier. Now when we got it out of the car, we didn't get the speaker wires out of it. It uses an Allen key. Now as I take these wires out and can kind of see what they've done here, they just folded the wires over and kind of stuffed them in there. As you can see from this guy, they didn't line it up with the Allen screw and the wire itself, so it just kind of cut through the insulation. This is why you would use a ferrule or some form of a connection to go into this, is so that you're actually touching the wire. This one here, where they screwed it in, is into the insulation, so the screw went in and just pushes it in, and this ball here on the end is what's pushing in there and creating sound. This is a failure at some point for sure, and this one is the exact same way. So for anyone out there that's like, why do you use ferrules? This is why you'd use a ferrule. Couple features about this amplifier, power protect light on one side, flip it over on the other side, you have two channel, four channel mode. As far as your input goes, you have high pass off and sub for channels one and two, and then on channels three and four, you have high pass, low pass, sub, plus bass boost, and then the gains are also located close on the inside here to both RCAs. Now this amplifier, I believe, is about 110 watts by four, which is plenty of power for what we're going to be doing today. Next up are the speakers that we're gonna be putting into the front door is this guy here, which is the ES165KX2 mid bass. I need to get all of this butyl off of the speaker. Mineral Spirits will remove it, however, does make kind of a gooey mess. If you can get it off just by simply rubbing it and or using a ball, it will stick to itself pretty well. Can't even get this screw out because it's all stuck into that. Anyways, this is gonna take some time. Let's also take a look at the back side of the speaker here where they did our booger soldering job. That's really awesome. So they just kind of stuck the wire through the hole, twisted around, tried to add some solder to it and did a really crappy job. The problem with doing that is tinsel leads can wick the solder in and you can overheat them and you can really screw up a speaker. If you don't know how to solder, for the love of God, just put speaker terminals on it and call it a day. It's not a bad thing to do. Doing this and not doing a good job is pretty, pretty bad. To be extremely careful in getting this off. I might just actually cut it and sand it off instead of reheating up the speaker. I don't know, I have to kind of take a look at it and see how I'm gonna do that. Are gonna be the flax, six and a half inch component. Now luckily they didn't goo up the front of this one. The only thing they did was the booger solder joints here on the back. Speakers are both flat, which is good. They didn't warp them, putting them in those janky mounts. As far as the tweeters, this is the front A pillar. This is the passenger side. The customer was complaining about there was a noise coming from this tweeter and that was because the tweeter wasn't actually attached. It was just sitting in here like this. So the noise he was hearing was this cone tapping into this. Luckily, nothing damaged the cone. Now how they did attach these was just a little tiny ball of what looks like some silicone or hot glue. Clearly not enough. The plan for these is to mount these somewhere in the back, maybe in the hole that they created in the back panel where the K2 tweeter is. I don't know how I'm gonna do that because we don't have any of the pieces for this, so that will be interesting to figure out. Speaking of the back speaker, this is it here. It's just kind of stuck in. Now most people don't know that, but these speakers do actually come out of these mounts if you push really hard. Uh, if I can get the butyl that they used to stick this <sighs> into here. So I'm guessing they couldn't figure out how to mount it properly. So, you know, they didn't use silicone, but they used more black sticky crap. This is this 3M Sircock. Now the nice thing is we got enough of this crap that we found that we could use this to fill the holes if we want. And then if you pull on it, the grill will come off. And so that does make this speaker a lot more manageable. And most people don't know it will do that. The thought, my thought is, is to put this guy like this and make a bracket that allows me to put this tweeter into here like this and then put this back into the door so that 
we, you know, we can cover up those giant holes that they have. I will be cleaning this up. We'll be just soaking in mineral spirits to get all this goo off of here. It'll come right off. It's kind of my plan is to maybe do that now that I have this down to its smaller size. As you can see, it will go into this way easier. And we do have to make a bracket to get it into this. Which is cool because we've actually made these brackets for this before. So it's just a matter of, of redesigning that particular bracket to fit this tweeter's size. So we have a plan for getting these two tweeters put in the right location. Next up is these giant passive crossovers that we have. Now this is one of those times where it's like, mm, what I'd really like to do is just use that Focal amp to power this guy here. They're both bi-ampable, which means I can run a four channel amp into this because the amplifier doesn't have bi amp capability. Look at this, I got this stuff on me. Oh God, it's so disgusting. Use this just to power the front speakers. Lots of power going to them. They'd sound wonderful. The problem is, is this passive cross over here. We don't have an amp to power these. We'd have to use the radio, which is only like 15 watts and trying to pump the radio through something like this would just be a bad idea. That's why a lot of the times if we're gonna put something like this in the front, we do a real basic speaker in the back door, which wouldn't require a lot of work. Very efficient, low power handling, speaker and that'll be super loud coming off of that radio we're going to use. In this case, that's not what's going to happen. That means I'm going to clean these up, mount these in the back on the amp rack. So we'll have, you know, two pairs of crossovers back there to power these things up and we'll run new tweeter wires into the rear doors and the other tweeter wires will go up into the A pillars. Lastly, the media upgrade is going to be this guy here, which is the Kenwood Axelon DMX 908S. This is one of the new models that they just came out with. It is a USB C radio. We have a flush mount USB C bracket from PAC, which is the USB CDMA3. I don't know where I'm going to put this yet, but if we have some place to put this, this will be the unit that goes in there. This comes with a bag of screws. It also comes with a C to regular USB adapter. Every now and then you, you gotta use this, but if I can put a USB-C somewhere on the dash, I would much rather put that there and then if they don't have the current cable for their phone, then they can use this until they get it. This has an externally mounted GPS antenna because it is wireless CarPlay and Android Auto. Typical Kenwood power harness, the microphone. Kenwood always comes with this spacer here that we're not gonna need. Uh, this is your sanity piece that it comes with there's nothing in it it's just so you can sit here and pop holes for a little while to you know calm your nerves after pulling out a particularly crappy 911 instruction manual the radio itself one of the reasons why I simply love this radio is for one it's a 9 series which means it has all the 9 series tech built into it, it sounds amazing it's nice and but favorite thing about this particular radio is it's a short chassis that means all that garbage that was behind that radio can get tucked up into behind the actual radio it's not going to be as tight and packed in and just uh, like it was before short chassis radios are great for that kenwood does a really nice job of putting everything on the back of the radio here let's take a closer look at it for those of you that are unfamiliar with some of the inputs and outputs of this radio located behind this panel here there's a screw up here on the top. Once you remove that, your USB-C gets locked in as well as it has the micro HDMI. This will do the Kenwood dash cam. Your mic plugs in here. Sirius XM, iData is these two right here. Your GPS antenna is this great plug. RCA outputs are located on the side here all together. Something to note about all Kenwoods if you've never put one in before is it goes rear, front, sub. A little bit different than everyone else's. It's something to keep in mind. The antenna is wired off the back, which is nice. I like a pigtail. It does have AV in if you need it. That's a full AV in, means it takes a four, can conductor 3.5 millimeter jack that goes into this. That way, if for one, you need an extra camera, because this will do four cameras, it can plug in here, as well as if you're gonna do some kind of, let's say an overhead with a DVD player or whatever you need that's AV, basic aux jack. It'll all plug into this. Then you have camera three located here at the top. 
your rear camera, your front camera, and then there is an AV in and out also. So this has multiple capabilities of getting other video sources into it, as well as your power plug is located here on the side. Cooling system is located off to here. There is a fan inside of the radio, and no, you don't hear the fan when it's inside the dash. Then you have the nice seven inch touchscreen that Kenwood has been using for a very long time. It has the shelf here across the bottom and the big screen on top. Track up and down, attenuation, home button menu, selection, as well as cam. And then if you press and hold the menu button, it shuts the display off if you press and hold the selection button it will do voice since they did not use a smart harness to do whatever they did and after talking with the customer it turns out that radio was in the car when he bought it and the people that worked on it and put all these speakers and amps in didn't change out to a proper harness which is kind of weird the whole install was just kind of weird we are going to be adding in the idata rr needs the rf01 harness to integrate into the car the dash kit actually is in good shape other than it's just dirty I will just take this over into the bathroom, clean up all the dirt that's on here that's just, you know, from years of being in the car. Then I'll get the new Kenwood mounted into it, trim up the backside here, trim these off because I'm not going to need those the way the new radio is going to mount. We'll get to all that in a little bit. Now it's just a matter of cleaning. I have to clean all this stuff up. Good news is I was able to get this back to like new condition. I was able to get all of the buta rubber off of it. It's all cleaned up. It's all out of this gap here where it was actually sticking the surround over I mean it was everywhere was able to get off all the solder believe it or not it was easier just to cut it because it was such a crappy connection it just kind of peeled right off just not good but good for us the same thing can be said about the flax peeled right off a little bit of sanding trimming but they're good as new all set and ready to go so the first two are all cleaned up next we'll be working on some brackets to get these back into the car we're going to start with the rear speakers first. It just seems like it's easier. This is the appropriate bracket that is required in order to get the speaker into place. Now this is a bracket that we've made previously and it's basically where you take, which we don't have now, is the factory speaker and you take it over to the router table and you router it out. And then you take the six and a half inch itself, which is this, and then attach it and re-router it out so that you have this new shape. It's kind of hard to explain it without actually being able to do it. But if you think of the factory speaker looking something like this, you'd attach that to your new piece of material, the whole speaker, and then you would ride around the ball bearing here. You'll end up with what would look like this, but we need to add this little piece to it here. And there's a couple different ways you can do it. If the speaker comes with a grill, you can double stick tape the grill onto this and then attach it to a new piece of material and repeat the process. But since we don't have the speaker, but we have this from a previous version that we've done this on, we're just gonna have to go with that. And that's why if you're doing this, it's always nice to make a template so that if something like this comes in, you can figure it out. Now this guy is 3 16 of an inch thick, so a little less than a quarter, which is perfect for going into this. However, the one thing that is part of the reason why they did such a crappy job is the basket of the speaker is bigger than the hole because it's a five by seven. That means it's five by seven. This is a six and a half, which means it's a six and a half. So we have to cut the door panel. If you place this guy on to line it up, you'll see that blue area there and that blue area there. That needs to be removed so that the speaker will go in. Now we've test fit it and we know it's nowhere near this. It's actually sitting about a half inch off from that. The reason why we want to remove that and get it tucked in there is because the way that that sits, that's a perfectly flat grill. And if we don't move the speaker, room and try to move it out the speaker's gonna hit that fernando's marked it up on the other side he's gonna be using an air saw and he'll just buzz out those two little areas take a look and see what that looks like I screwed the speaker together so we could test fit it now on the bracket we have foam here we have foam on the back side of the speaker and i've only put two of the screws in because this bracket actually has to be screwed in before and you can see here, just trimmed a little area there and there. And now the speaker will go in and sit flush. If you'll notice, these 
little areas here, they're countersunk in because the speaker sits over where the factory screw holes go. That's something to consider when making a bracket like this that is a bigger speaker than the hole provides for you is where are those factory screws and how are you gonna get them back in so they don't affect your new speaker. We used our laser to cut these brackets out. As you can hear in the background, there's another one being made right now. We wanted to make sure this one fit into place. When drilling into plastic, there's a couple different ways you can actually attach the screws into them. There's thermal certs, or you can also use a tap and die set to drill into your acrylic so that your screw will go into place, which is what we did on these. The next task is going to be figuring out how to get the tweeter to mount into this bracket here. For that, we're gonna need my laptop and some calipers. One of the things you should have in your tool bag, or at least your toolbox, is a nice set of calipers. Uh, they come in various lengths. I have small, medium, large, depending on what I'm working on. In this case, I need my small ones. And the goal of this is to take this tweeter bracket here that's been cut into the back door and make this much smaller tweeter fit inside of it. How we plan on achieving that is making an acrylic ring that is this size here and this size here. It's like a donut that will go up into this and allow this to line up inside of it. And then we can and attach it all together, put it back into the hole that they made in the side of the door. To start, I just need two measurements, the inside measurement of this and the outside measurement of that. And I'm gonna put that into my software here that will allow me to, to then export that out to my laser. I'm gonna create a circle. Doesn't have to be the right size yet. Calipers in hand. Measure across using the back side of the calipers. That looks like one, 184. Make sure I have the joined measurement. 1.84 gives us our new circle. We don't need the fill, we just need the stroke. Next is drop on my XY lines. Check to make sure it's lined up. Copy my circle, and then if I hold Shift Command V, we'll create a circle in the exact same spot, all lined up. And with that, I can measure this shape here which is 155.5. And as you can see, now I get a perfect donut. Label this tweeter spacer and export this out as an SVG so my laser can read the file. I just wanna get one of these made real quick so I can see if my idea will work. One of the nice things of the Glowforge is it gives us what's in the bed. Line it up on here, select my material, and hit print. And this is what we end up with. So when you take a really close look at the grill, there's these three teeth that stick out that this has gotta sit on. So this needs to be thicker. So this is like an eighth, maybe three sixteenths. It needs to be a quarter, which is okay because this is white and we're gonna be using black. And the other thing too is I want it to be this thickness, which is two, two pieces a quarter inch ought to get me the shape that I need. It's about a half inch thick. And I want that to be a little bigger. And this area here where that would go is a different shape. I think this is gonna work for this top piece. And then we'll make a second piece that's a bigger diameter for the back side of this and a bigger diameter because it doesn't have those three little teeth. And that should all really stick in here really well. I think this idea is exactly what we need. That means I want to print a, another one of these, but I'm going to do it in quarter inch black so that it'll be the right one. And then once we get that, we can get the measurements we need for the second circle that will go around here. I remade it out of quarter inch and that comes up and fits in the same way, which we knew it would. And then I made the bottom ring, which is a little bit bigger. And the two rings will sit on top of one another like this. So the easiest place to start is to get this bottom ring into place. It snaps in just like this, and then add the top ring onto the top of it and snap them together inside of this. And that lines them up so that they're, they're perfect. There's a slight lip inside of here because of the different sizes. That'll allow me to add in some glue. Acrylic glue just squeezes into place. Just run it around that lip. Give it a couple seconds to dry and then we'll pop it back out and we can put some acrylic glue on the other side. There's a slight lip there. All right, I'm gonna give that a couple seconds to dry. The next step is to make this grill stay exactly in here. For that, I'm just gonna use some regular CA glue. I like to use a little zip tie to help kind of steer it around. CA glue requires an activator. Once I've given them a little bit of time to dry, I can add my spacer in. 
and using the black acrylic as you can see it just looks normal as my tweeter want to make sure that my wiring is towards the bottom where this focal is believe it or not that snapped in perfect there's little teeth on the tweeter and I took a lot of time huh. off camera as you can see these are the failed attempts getting it so that the little teeth that are on here squeeze into place so that this is all held in just like the factory tweeter was into this so it all just snaps in and that gives us our flax tweeter mounted in our big grill so that this can go into that back door and with that done I'll do the second tweeter and then I'll get these both mounted into that back door so that I can get it over Fernando so he can put some connectors on here so this will be serviceable that will be one step closer to having those back doors on to mount these tweeters in these back doors unlike the way they did it with the passive crossovers down in here uh, these are actually pretty easy to get through what I mean by that is if you remove the back seat you can get this C pillar off which we have to remove the back seat anyways because that's where all the amplifiers are going to go we can then get these C pillars off which we need to get off anyway so we can run the wire we can then run wires through right magical now how do you get this back seat out this one is fun remember when you first came here and you tried to take that back seat out hi my name is Fernando and <laughs> one of the challenges I always <laughs> yeah this one really killed him trying to get this back seat out. It's actually not that bad. The first thing you do is remove all the headrests. And if you can get past that, you're doing pretty well. Next is to remove this little guy here. There's a plastic piece on top of this that pops off and there's two 10 millimeter bolts. One. And this oh. one is only one. Oh, bonus. There's only one 10 millimeter underneath it. So you remove that. This isn't locking the seat down or anything. It's just you remove it because it makes it easier to get the seat up instead of having to like pull it around and get that out of the way. It's just kind of like a reference where it has to go, so. The next part is the tricky part. You have to stick your hand in like this and you're gonna reach around and you're gonna feel for this straight piece of plastic that's on this bar right here. And what it is, is it's a piece of plastic that looks like this and you're gonna bend it back. And when you bend it back, you'll be able to lift this seat up. But also you have to push it down a little bit so you can bend it back. This is true. A little exploratory push down. You can feel it give way. You good? Uh -huh. And then just push up. It does help if you have two people. Nothing sucks worse than getting one side off and then going around to get the other side off and then this side clips in. It's like, ugh, it's ridiculous. With the back seat out, we can now remove this seat pillar easily and also get an idea of what we need as far as room goes. You wanna keep the amps low on this you don't want to put them up high there's not a lot of room up high sometimes in this area here there's a power window motor lucky for us there isn't one so we'll be able to use majority of this space here to mount our amplifiers this is shaped like this because behind these are those cool little vents that prevent the windows from blowing out when you shut the doors and also allow air to get into the car you can remove one of them if you need to but you definitely got to keep at least one of them for us to remove the side panel it's a clip that goes in the corner right here so you just grab your pry tool pop it out it's a seven millimeter in the top and then from there kind of You have to remove the seat belt. Removing that panel will give you access to this grommet, which will give you a hole on this side. Fernando's gonna walk us through the process in which he used to get that wire through now that we have the back seat out. As you see, we ran a new wire all the way from here to here, but because we don't know if for some reason they're gonna do a service on the door and the factory makes the plug right here, it's easy to unplug it, remove it, they can remove the whole thing. So what we did, made the connection in the inside part of it. So when they remove this, they can see the label that the connection is inside. It says connection right here, which is hard to see because of the lighting and whatnot, but it, he made this cool, there we go. So, and then for you to able to remove it, unplug it, this is gonna be our tweeter right here. Everything is zip tied up. Same following the factory harness. It goes right here. Connection for our tweeter. We got our mid base over here that we're using the existing factory wire. Let me get the speaker mounted and then I'm gonna show you how it looks before I put the door panel back together. The door is all back together. Water barrier, it's back together just like the factory. The speaker is mounted in place, of course. We have our tweeter. The easy way to do is just kind of put it from the bottom, it holds, grab your tweeters, negative, positive, and then 
You got you. Thank you. And then this one comes out. Yes, you do need three hands. You need few hands, that's for sure. So this one over here in this corner, you gotta pay attention on this one because sometimes it get caught in those plastic and you don't want to smash the, the speaker wire. I mean, the reality is, is that's just not a good place to put the tweeter anyways. No, no, not at all, but but we're playing with the cards that we were dealt and that's where it was. He didn't want to buy a whole new panel just because they screwed this up. We have to be careful the way we put it back together to make sure we don't screw up our tweeter. The reason why he's struggling with this is there's little teeth that have to get put into these holes and all of them have to line up and then the whole door will slide down. And if you don't get them all, you gotta pull back up and start over. Yeah. Two six millimeters in the top, one six millimeter in the bottom, two tens, clips, don't forget to do you sit belt and that's it. So some of you are like, man, I really wish I could put a tweeter in my rear door like this. A couple things that you should kind of pay attention to. One, try to put it on a flat area. The reality is, is this gray area here would have been a much better place for the tweeter because it's flat. However, I don't know what's behind this. It might not have fit here. They probably didn't do a lot of experimenting. The other thing too is you wanna get it further back here in the door panel because you gotta figure when we shut this door, it's gonna be right here next to this. All right, so we have to make sure we attenuate this tweeter down because this is a very loud tweeter and we don't want it to just, that's all you hear. Preferably, the coaxial would be the move. Put one here and just call it a day, but just something to keep in mind. Flat area, more towards the rear. Now it's time to get this big boy tweeter into this guy here. This has a really big mount on it. It's not tiny and this grill, well, you know, it's it's not the most easy thing to get the speaker into. I can see why they tried to put the smaller speaker in here. However, the hole opening is, is okay. It's just, this has such a big mount around it. So I'm not, I'm not worried about getting the sound through. I, it'll carry through and we can make a funnel so that it all goes out the grill, which is nice, but it's just figuring out how to get this guy in here and of course have it fit back in the car. Conveniently enough, we've done these tweeters before, so I actually have a diagram of this layout. It's just a matter of modifying that layout so that it will house this big tweeter. My thought is I'm just going to cut one of these real quick so that I can have an actual piece in my hand because that's always nice. And then from there, we'll make adjustments to it in the software so that we can get one that fits perfect and mounts that tweeter just like that. Now to do that, I need to change my inner size here to the new tweeter, which is a lot bigger, almost 0.4 inches bigger. And it's, it's so much bigger now, it's bigger than the outside trim ring, which is kind of funny. We'll have to do some modifications to this to get that new piece to fit. And we'll kind of do like we did on the last one, where we just copied it into the same size. Make it a little bigger. Let's see how big the outside diameter of this guy is. 0.9, it's really thin. We'll have to give it a go. Move some of the old pieces. And then I'll just clean this up and we'll print it and see what it looks like. I printed out what we drew. It's super thin. I mean, it's like 0.1 thickness. And what I forgot to equate for is on the K2 tweeter, there's a little tiny nipple, like we were talking before, these friction rings. When you're cutting something this thin, it has to be perfect. And I didn't equate to add that in. So naturally this snapped in half as soon as I went to put it on because it was way tighter than it should have been. So it's something I have to add in to the next one, but I can still use it as a mock-up to kind of figure out how everything needs to go and what I need to do to it so that for one, that, that won't happen again. And I could make one that will work, but I can go a little bit thicker than I made this one. As you can see, I made this one oh so thin. And this is the nipple here. It's a little line right there that caused me all the heartache. I'm also gonna add in some arms that come off of here and make it not so simple shape and make it a little bit thicker. We started with this idea here and it modified into this idea here. I had mentioned we were gonna fatten these areas up. Can't go all the way down because of the way the screw mounts are. There's little teeth here. I wanna make sure those stay because those help to lock this all in place. I fattened this up just a little bit, like ugh, ever so slightly, and I added that 
tooth to it. And with that, the tweeter will now come in carefully, line the tooth up, rotate a little bit, and then work it left to right, very, very tight. My tweeter is mounted into place. If this is one is made out of white acrylic. I do have an idea that I want to also add to this, is I'm going to print a second version of this, minus the screw holes, and glue it onto this, making this twice as thick this way, this one is just a test fit to make sure that it's the way it needs to be. Drop it into place. This is thicker than the factory screws, so I have swapped them out for half inch. And that gets me my tweeter mounted into place. But let's take this over to the car before we do anything and make sure this will now fit into the vehicle. The driver's side, this is perfectly smooth. There's nothing on it. But for some reason on the passenger side, they have this wire here that's, I've already removed it just because I don't want to take a chance of it screwing up. And it's easy enough to just move it out of the way. This has these little feet here on the bottom that allow you to line it up. You kind of come at it at an angle putting the bottom in first, and then there's a clip on the top. I'm super happy with the fact that this actually goes in. That's awesome. So we know it fits. That means I can make those modifications that I wanna to make to it, get it all put back together so that I can hand it off to Fernando and he can pretty it all up and make it look sexy. And that is with the second piece glued on, adding that extra height to it, making it a bit thicker. It allows me to still use those half inch screws. It will still fit into place like so. Before I screw it down though, I'm gonna let Fernando get his tech flex and butt connectors and stuff like that on it. I'm just gonna add in my screws so we don't lose them. If you notice while I was screwing these in, I was using a Phillips screwdriver. I can't stress this enough. Anytime you're doing something into a panel, do it by hand. The drill is your best friend when unscrewing, but screwing back in. There you go. With the rear doors done, it's time to work on the fronts. We've got the K2s all cleaned up and looking spiffy. Now, we kind of have a similar problem that we ran into with the rear doors in that we don't have the factory speed what do we do now they're both five by sevens true and so we could easily take that same piece that we use for the rear and put it on the front and if it was any other speaker smaller wise than something like this giant guy here we'd probably be doing that but this is a big boy speaker we've put these in the front door of one of these before we know the problems that we're gonna run into and that is the window this is gonna hit it it's just gonna happen so we have to move this out well when we move it out the door panel is gonna hit it it's like a lose-lose all the way around the last time we did one of these we figured out we needed to come up with a shape like this because we needed a little bit more room and a little bit more surface area the other thing too is we also had a bunch of cut they went like you have to trim on the top and bottom but they went ham on this thing they just nibble it all up and it looked terrible that gave us a couple ideas in that it was how to make a better bracket for that front door and give us some material here to help us get the speaker lined up in place and also countersink it with enough material so that we get the right depth on the speaker and then this was the acrylic piece that we made it ended up being an eighth of an inch bigger and that was so that we could put another space around here and have more room. Let's take a look at the door and I'll show you this on there. And then we'll take this over to the router and we're gonna cut this out a half inch. We end up going a little bit deeper down on the bottom side than we do on the top side just because of the way the factory grill covers this. Now we kind of get an idea of what this is doing. Now the reason why it's oblong like this is because obviously we need to cover that hole that is right here. And we wanted to make sure because of the K2, it's a much bigger driver, that there's a good half inch of area on this metal so that it makes a nice bond to the door and it's not flimsy and there's no weak parts. It's a heavy speaker. We want a nice big thick mount for it. Now that we know that, let's go over to the router and start making these. For this, we've cut two pieces of half inch blown PV. We have template tape. We need to stack them on top of one another. Next, we need to get this bracket attached. I need to drill a hole here in the center for my router bit to come up through. We use a Mobile Solutions quad bearing spiral cut bit that's quarter inch, because they do make a half inch version too. It's very scary. It's this guy right here. Ooh, yeah, animal. My template has all these little holes in here. I need to recreate them in this before I separate it. 
This gets us the first piece that we need for the speaker bracket in our door. This bracket here is going to screw into the door via these four screw points. The speaker is going to sit on top of this, so I need to countersink those in. When countersinking into the blown PVC. You don't have to go too crazy on it because the screw will pull in some, just enough to where it gets it started. It'll make it flat. And even though I'm just test fitting it right now, putting on the foam, the foam adds some gapping. It'll stick it out just a little bit more and we want to make sure we account for that. With the panel mounted in place, we have to test fit it. You can see I'm not happy, which I kind of knew it wasn't going to be, but let's see why. So this brings it out a half of an inch. But these little guys right here are the problem. When the speaker goes in, this hits the magnet. These are all counter flushed in. We added in that room. But now we need to figure out how far from here, which we knew we were going to have to do that. Let's be honest. We knew we were going to have to do that. How far do we need to move this out? And there's actually a pretty simple trick for that. As you can see, there's a screw hole here and a screw hole here. And what I've done is I took this screw and I put it into here and then I took my speaker and I kept it in there and it would just come in and out like this until it stopped hitting. And once I did and once I did that, I knew I was about a quarter of an inch. So now I need to make a spacer that is a quarter of an inch that will attach onto this and move that speaker out the next amount. Now, once all this is out, then we have to deal with this, which is a whole nother animal. We have to make sure the speaker fits into the door first, and then we'll worry about that. We know how big the hole has to be because we've got a hole in the thing already. Just like we have this template here, it's awesome to have circle templates like this. You can get a set of them like this from Mobile Solutions. We have both sets of theirs that allow us to easily, instead of having to fire up the laser and do this, I could just come over here, grab my stack, set them onto my speakers like this, and be like, yep, that's the one. And now I can double side tape this down to some quarter inch and make my spacer. And it'll sit just like this on top of the black piece that I currently have in the door. Just like the bigger pieces, double sided tape. Pull for the center, readjust the height. What I need to do is attach this to the spacer in the door. To do that, I'm gonna use some of this red Tessa double-sided tape, as well as the screws themselves. All sticky gooey. Let's go get into the door. To screw it in, I'm gonna use some three quarter inch screws. That will go all the way through both pieces. It won't go all the way through the half inch, but I mean, it's gonna go through the quarter inch and then a substantial deepness into the half inch. I don't need it poking out of the back side. I didn't put these two screws in as you just saw. I'm not to that point yet. Point I'm to is getting the door panel on and figuring out what area I need to remove from the door panel. The first thing you need to do is remove this metal grill. There's two clips on this side, one big clip on this side, two on top and bottom, and then it just pops right off. Get the door panel on nice and tight like it is going to be forever and ever. And now we can look at the problem we see. With it spaced out properly, remember it's a five by seven, not a six and a half, and it's got a five by seven hole. This area right here and this area right here need to be removed so that the speaker won't get screwed up. If I grab the same template I just made that extension out of, I can use a black marker and I can trace the area that I need to remove, both the inside and the outsides. If I have room and I can come all the way down to this part here, like down here, I wanna do that so the door will go in more but like in this top area here i can't so i'll probably end up going somewhere between there because i still need to make sure that that grill snaps back into place to remove this area here i used my roto zip with a spiral cut bit when you're doing that you want to come from underneath not from the top the reason why is it could buzz out and you could, ah, scratch the top of it so definitely don't do that i was able to get all the way to my outside line here, which is great. And then I just follow this straight line here. Let's get it on and see how we did. This will allow 
the speaker to move freely and come through the grill so we'll get all that luscious focal sound all out of the door with no restriction the other thing too is we won't need any fast rings or anything like that because we've moved that speaker out into this area here now the factory grill sits off of this like another half inch three quarters so we don't have to worry about it touching this it's out a lot this is kind of nice because we've moved it out as far as we can into the car. We won't have to worry about any of that back wave getting around to the back side of the speaker. And that brings up an interesting point for those of you guys who are like, oh, fast rings or, or something like that. The more you can bring the speaker out safely to the door panel, in some cases through the door panel if you want to make an external grill, the better it is and it reduces the need for let's say the fast ring and after all what the fast ring is doing is filling in all that space between where the speaker stops and the door panel begins if you move the speaker out more it reduces the need for that pretty cool with all the speakers well on their way to being put in it's time to move on to the next project for me which is getting the amplifiers put into the car, building the amp rack, that kind of thing. Behind the back seat, we saw this cool piece here. There's three little clips and this whole carpet comes off and that exposes this area here. Ooh. In this area, we have the two amplifiers and the four passive crossovers that have to go in here. There's really nothing back here to get in the way. This is a pretty straight shot. However, the things you have to keep in mind are these guys right here. There's a bar that comes in here and locks into place. These are the locks right here that we reach behind and pull back. So we have to make sure we stay out of the way there. The other thing too is that we wanna put the carpet back in in some capacity because this creates a lot of noise. Whatever we build, we're then gonna cut the carpet around to put it back into place. Because we know we're not gonna be up here and there's no reason to have that exposed. We wanna cover these too because noise will come through those that we don't need. Now keep in mind there's a big seat in front of them. Over here in the corner, you still might hear some of that road noise which we don't wanna hear. My thinking initially, just right off the top of my head, is I'm just gonna build a long panel that comes across here, comes up to this. This is gonna be what we're gonna attach it to because this is double metal. This comes out and there's an actual firewall behind it. I can put nut certs into this and it's not going to be exposed to the back side of the car. Whereas if I drill into this, well then I'm just an idiot and I put screws out of the back of the car and it's going to cause rust and all that other fun stuff. This area here and this area here are both safe to attach the amp rack to. So knowing that, we have changed our thought on how we're going to do the power wire. Initially we plugged the hole on the passenger side, but in thinking it through, we're going to plug the hole on the driver's side and we are going to come up the passenger side. The reason for that is if you look at the amplifiers, the power wires both come out on the passenger side of the vehicle. And if we do that, it'll be a shorter run of power, which means we can go with a smaller power wire. If we were to go up the driver's side, we'll have to go with like a zero gauge because it's like 21 feet, which is a lot. Whereas if we come up the passenger side, it's only going to be like 12 feet. We can go with a four gauge wire as opposed to a zero gauge wire, which makes a lot more sense because these amplifiers really don't draw a lot of power. The plan is lay everything out here on the bench and then figure out what I need to cut to go in there. So let's get started. So my plan is this. The two amplifiers are gonna sit here directly in the middle. Power wire out the bottom. RCA is out the top. Crossovers are gonna go left and right. So we'll have left crossovers, right crossovers, and whatnot. And then over here off to the side will be a power distribution fuse holder. Cause this one has a fuse, this one does not. So that means I'm going with a fuse distribution block for the power. This is a steel truck, not an aluminum truck. So we can ground it in the back at a factory ground point somewhere. We don't have to worry about that. I'm gonna cut a piece of quarter inch material. I haven't decided which kind yet it's gonna be 36 by 15 and that will give me enough to attach it at the top and tongue into the bottom I cut my panel to size before I take it over to the workbench and start adding equipment to it I'm adding in my screw points via nut certs now if you've never seen a nut cert before it's this little piece right here it's kind of like a rivet but it threads on and because it threads on you can put it into metal or plastic or something like that and when you squeeze these two handles it'll make it permanently mounted in there and I can put a screw into it and it makes it easily serviceable and really nice as opposed to just throwing a self-tapping screw in there. There's a couple different versions of it. This one you just squeeze, pre-drill the hole, get it in there, 
squeeze it shut, you unscrew it, and now I have a nut inserted, nut insert, into the metal that I can put three screws into this amp rack and hold it into place. I'm also gonna put a piece of foam across the back when I'm done so that I don't have plastic on metal rattle. We don't want that. Let's head over to the bench and take a look at this with the amps attached. And I've attached all the product to the amp rack. K2 crossovers on top, flax crossovers on the bottom, power distribution block, it's all screwed in and ready to go. The next step is before we start wiring it, because once we've wired it, we've committed fully to it, is to take it over into the truck and set it in place, drop the back seat into place in front of it to make sure that nothing hits and it's gonna work. It's important to do at this point. You have a light over there? All right, we're good. The amplifiers will fit. Nothing from the seat is gonna get in the way of it. So things are progressing great on the amp rack. I'll get it back out of the car, get it over to the bench, and we'll start the wiring process, which I'm just gonna jump ahead on that one. We'll explain what we've done when we get back. And there we have it, the wiring is complete. Let's take a closer look. Let's see what is happening here. Looking down here at the bottom is where we ran all the power wire. We did a stacked configuration. As you see, there's no ground, but there is ground. And what they are is they're up underneath the power wire. The reason why I did that is by stacking it here, it kept this nice and narrow, which I knew I was gonna need because I'm gonna have these speaker wires coming over for the crossovers. If you'll see here on the two amplifiers, the ground is after the power here and before the power here. That's gonna make things a little interesting. By stacking them like that allowed me to keep everything in order all the way through the run. If we zoom out just a little bit, here they go into the block and across the bottom here they go out to where they'll ground in the back of the car. That allowed me to compensate for the weirdness of the two amplifiers. Passive crossovers are mounted passenger on this side because this is the passenger side of the back of the car and drivers on this side. That posed another problem when it comes to the RCAs because the standard amplifier is this is driver, this is passenger. I needed to flip my inputs over here so that it would correspond to the way the amplifier is getting laid out. After all, all they are is numbers on an amplifier. It really doesn't matter just so you have front divided from rear. The covers for the K2s are not on yet because there are several adjustments that can be made on top of the K2s and that means I'm gonna wait until we're done, we're listening to the car. I'm gonna test these to see if any of these improve the way the car sounds. For example, you have level of tweeter configuration, zero, negative three, plus three. So if we feel we need a little bit more treble boost, we can attach that here. We also have tweeter crossover adjustability between 12 and 18, and mid-range crossover blending with the tweeter between 12 and six. Then they have this other one over here, which is called tweeter shelf. So there's several adjustments that can be made to help it sound better. So with our tweeter way up in the A pillar and the mid-range down in the door, some of these may help it sound a little more full up front. So we'll wait to put the covers back on until we're done there. Subwire is coming off to the bottom. This has a left and right speaker cup. So we ran a left and right wire, then terminated the ends with some ferrules. All the wires run out to the sides. Come over and look at this end. Here we have the rear speaker wires that are gonna get attached in that rear C pillar area. And then all of the front speakers run up to the front on the end here. We have white with orange and white with black. White with orange will be for the tweeters and white with black will be for the mid bass. Same with the gray, same configuration. And we ran a six channel 4000 series Stinger RCA with the remote turn on coming out along with it all set and ready to go. This amp rack is all set ready to get into the car now. The only thing that I didn't mention was the power wire. Fernando is currently working on the fuge distribution block and he's gonna be running the power wire to the back so we'll attach that once we get it into the car. The nice thing about having the distribution block here is that we can pre-run it and save time because he's moved ahead of me because these things take a long amount of time to do. Let's get this dropped into the car and we'll see what it looks like. And for those counting at home, that means both the doors are done. Fernando's moved on to the tweeters. The driver's side is in. Now, what did you do for wiring on the tweeters? I grab, of course, new wires, run it to the dash. That that's where we are going to hook it up. Prettied up the connector that I made on there. All right, nice. We have our connector over here. 
and then up into place it will go. The reason why we ran the tweeter wires into the dash is he said that's where we're gonna make our connections. We're running four wires up front, two mid bass, two tweeters, and it's easier just to have them go to the same spot where all the wiring is gonna come into. In the rear, we showed you this wire here for the tweeter. And in doing that, we thought about it a little bit and we're like, you know what, since we're right here, it would make more sense if we just grabbed the two mid range there instead of running them all the way up. Because we have the C pillars off, so there's no reason not to. The plan is to make the connection for the mid range and tweeter right next to one another in the back back there. And that'll just cut down on the amount of wires we have to run. Because we do still have to run quite a few of them. And this, is it in the vehicle all complete all set and ready to go over on the side here is where we made our connections for the rear speakers the wires just come along the bottom here and up in the running board area here tucked in to the factory is our rca and the front speaker wires the same is true on the passenger side there is our rear speakers our ground is located right underneath the seat belt on a bolt there and then the power wire goes up along the passenger side while i was doing that fernando took some time and got the power wire in comes through the factory hole that we had earlier plugged we unplugged it and we replugged the one on that side zip tied it into the main harness come around this side he made this bracket right here that attaches to the battery pan and located the fuse here so now it is solid mounted and ready to go and then attached it to the battery here power is all set the only piece of this puzzle we have left the gaping hole in the dash this one here and what Fernando's doing right now is it had this steering wheel control interface in it that was hardwired so he's going back in like he did way at the beginning of this video when we fixed that kick panel over there and he's fixing the factory harness retaping it up and getting it back to factory let's head over the bench and we'll get that radio prepped and ready to get into the car it's time to get the radio mounted into the newly cleaned dash kit this is a Metro 5819. It's actually a pretty nice dash kit for these, the way it goes together. I think it looks really nice in the dash. When doing a Kenwood radio, or any radio for that matter, most of the time the radio comes with some screws. Make sure you choose to use those screws. In this case, they use a fine thread screw, and if you use a coarse thread screw, all you're going to do is cross thread the unit. When using a short chassis radio, it's kind of a little bit difficult sometimes to put it in because you don't have those screws two screw points to level out the radio. It is a little bit more interesting trying to figure out which upper and lower screw points to use. When you're tightening up your screws, get one side on and then look at the top and bottom as you're tightening up the other side. Make sure you keep it straight in the dash kit. This wasn't straight in the dash at all when we took it out. We wanna make sure we keep it straight in the dash kit. And it might take a couple tries. All right, and after a little bit of work, have it in there nice and straight across the top here, which is what matters. Now you'll notice it has these little winglets hanging off the back because it's a short chassis. It's up to you. I like to remove them. Some people use them to attach their harnesses to. There's a lot of uses for them. Me, I like them gone. And just like that, they're all trimmed up and ready to go. Now the other thing too is that these top pieces here were hitting when this was in. So I'm gonna sand these. Uh, you can't sand them off because they are part of the kit, but I could sand them a little bit shorter so they don't get in the way. And for the sanding, I just used this three inch sanding disc on my Milwaukee sander. And as you can see, it took that down. It's out of the way now, so when this goes in, it won't get caught up on the dash and cause it to bow any. The radio is all set. This is all we had to do for this. Pretty nice. For integration, we're gonna be using the RR. For this, you need the RFO1 or the HRFO1. Uh, one is harness ready. If you can get the harness ready version of it, that's the way to go because then you don't have to wire up the harness. It'll just plug in. We don't have that one currently in stock. We still have some of these left, so we're gonna be doing it the old fashioned way. Oh my gosh, which is wire to wire wiring this thing up. The color codes are going to match up. If it has a color here, it's gonna have a color on this to go along with it. If you're one of those people who likes to know what these colors mean, I will tell you real quick. There's three power wires. One is red, which is going to be key or ignition. It's uh, the wire that gets 12 volts when the car is on and running, or depending on the car, maybe in the back position or in the accessory position. Yellow is constant 12 volts. This is your memory wire. Black is ground. Onto your second 
secondary wires, you have an orange white, which is illumination. This is what causes the radio to dim when the lights turn on. That is on most cars a data wire. I mean, it's gonna come from this harness here. Very rarely are they still behind the dash. It has a blue and a blue with a white stripe. The blue is for an amplified antenna turn on, and the blue with the white stripe is to turn on our external amplifiers. There's another blue wire that is blue with a yellow stripe, not to be confused with the blue with the white stripe. They both have these flags on there. The blue with the yellow stripe is for if you're doing some form of external steering wheel controls. With the RR, you do not use that because it's done through data into the back of the radio. Purple with white, this long one here, is going to be your reverse trigger. This sees 12 volts when the car is in reverse and activates a backup camera if it has one. Light green is your emergency brake wire. This needs to see a ground when the emergency brake is applied and that'll allow you to get in access into some of the hidden features in the radio. On this, there's two dark green wires with stripes that say cam plus cam negative. This is for a specific camera that Kenwood makes. This allows you to control the view angles on that specific camera. If you're not using it, these wires are not gonna be used. They will not be on the RR harness. And then you have your eight speaker wires divided into pairs, a solid color and a stripe color. The solid color is positive, the stripe color is negative. White is driver's front, gray is passenger front, green is driver's rear, and purple is passenger rear. These wires we will not be using because we're not gonna be using deck power at all, so we'll be capping these off. Now in the RR, a couple things that you should know. One, it comes with the new brain. This is it here, this is what the RR module looks like. And the newer versions of the RR come with just one bag of goodies. If you've done one in the past, may have two bags. And there is four pieces inside of that. One is the USB flasher. So you do need to go to their website, idatalink.com or maestro.com and download the software. And that is what's gonna tell this module here, which is universal, that it's going in this F-150. It's also gonna give you the ability to print or have on your screen all the wiring instructions. They're all there. It'll allow you to program your steering wheel controls and all that as well. It's all done through the software. It's super simple, super sexy. It's one of my favorite. They give you the analog steering wheel control wire, which we'll not be using, as we said. And it gives you two other harnesses. One is a data to data, has a four pin connector on each end. This is data to data that's gonna hook up to this and talk to the radio. And then there's a secondary cable that has a three pin with an aux style end on it. This is done for a lot of secondary features that are built into the radios. This in the instructions is going to be the cable that is gonna be not necessarily mandatory. So when you're looking at the instructions, it's gonna have a picture of a radio and a picture of the brain. If you see two wires, these are the two wires they're talking about. If you see one wire, the data wire is all they're talking about. And here's a screenshot of what our instructions look like. Now inside of this particular harness, comes with all our connections. At the beginning of this video, we said this was a data radio. And the reason we figured that out was because there was no accessory in the car. And that's in this plug here. And as you can see, there is no red wire anywhere in this. It's gonna be using two data wires to turn it on and off. And this is designed to just plug in to our RR. And then on the end here, and on this end here, it has all the wires that we need to hook up to this. It has our eight speaker wires. In this case, you see RCAs on there. If this was an amplified system, System, we'd leave these on and plug them in. If it's not an amplified system, you simply just cut these off and they go off to the speakers. Over here, these shorter wires are going to be all our connections for the others. We have a red, a yellow, and a black for our power wires. We have an orange or purple white and a blue with a white stripe to match up with these. And then it has a couple of odd ones and one that I forgot to mention, which is this pink wire here. This is VSS. This is for the navigation while connected over wireless CarPlay or Android Auto. It's a speed sense wire. It does have a connection for it here, this white one, but then it has a yellow with a black stripe. This is for foot brake. If you were doing an Alpine, some of the older Alpines require a foot brake. And then it has a brown wire. Sometimes brown wire is what we call cellular phone mute. Very rarely do we still have a function for this, but they still put it in a lot of the harnesses. And then also on this, way over here, it has this pink with a red stripe. This is for steering wheel controls on some of the Fords. You do have to go grab a wire in the deck at the sync module for controlling the phone. And that'll be something that they do show you in the instructions that we took a look at. If it has a backup camera, it'll come with the corresponding backup camera harnesses. And in some cases, you do need to connect into the OBD2. The reason why it is designed to be plugged in is in case any service does need to be done to the car, it can be removed. That service can be done and it won't be blamed on this brain being in the car. The task now is to get this all put together. Harness is done and all set and ready.
Alrighty, I like to make this Y-shaped harness here. Why? Because I do. Module's located here. All my ends here go off to the Kenwood radio. Two iData wires plug into the back of the radio. Coming over to this side, the two harnesses that are gonna plug into the vehicle. I like to put a pigtail off to the side that has a remote turn on, power, accessory, and ground. The speaker wires for the mid-base are located right here because we already took care of the rear speakers. That's a complete harness all set and ready to get into the car. Lots more room in the dash. Everything is tucked back and up, out of the way, nice and loose. We have two screws in holding it in place right now. We re-insulated the base knob here. If you saw it in the beginning, it was all exposed and looking pretty nasty. What we wanna do is a couple tests. And those tests are comprised of a polarity test, one, two, three, four, check the sound in all four corners test, and then get to some of the functionality like steering wheel controls and stuff like that. Something you have to do anytime you put a radio in. These are focals, and that typically means that the mid-base will be positive, the tweeter will be negative. So we should see a green light on the bottom and a red light on the top. We see that all four locations, golden. Before we do that, we're gonna play some pink noise. That's that speaker there, that speaker there, those in the back. And thankfully those over there. So that means all four corners are doing what they're supposed to, yay. And also you may want to put your ear next to the speakers and make sure they're all making sound. Most of the time when you do a component like this, you can tell if there's a tweeter working or not, but sometimes it might not, especially at low volumes. We have two greens, two reds, green, green, red, red, green, green, red, 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 green. So for those of you that are going, what the heck was that? That's a PT9A plus and it's a polarity checker. What that means is it's checking the direction that the speaker is moving so that we make sure they're going the direction we want. Green means it moves out, red means it moves in. It all has to do with the way the crossover is designed and why this is one way and the other way we don't have time for that. The next is to make sure that the buttons on the steering wheel are doing what they're supposed to do. If we get volume down, volume up. What's the weather like today? All right, so those are doing what we need them to do. Now those are some of the basic tests that we do. Right now we have our phone plugged into the radio cable. It's not plugged into the dash, but we did modify the existing USB to fit it. Fernando made this with the USB-C mount in it using that pack piece that we talked about earlier and that went right into there and now the USB-C is located in the sink. That's gonna go here. Plan now is to finish screwing the radio in, get the dash all put back together, get the running boards on, get these C pillars back in. Basically just put the whole car back together again minus the back seat. We're gonna leave the back seat out and also I have to cut that back piece of carpet it over this so that we can quieten the back of this down. Once we get that done, then it's time to tune, which for you is gonna be right now. And the car is back together and it's tune time as I said. We remove all of the coverings and stuff like that. When we're tuning the car, they don't need to be in there. They're not gonna be in there. When we're doing a tune, like a proper tune with an RT and all that. There's no one sitting in the car until the very end. There's no tools or anything like that. But it's important to put the car back together as much as possible before you do the tune to put it back in its natural state. Put the seats back where they belong and all that. Now for this, we are not gonna be putting the back seat in until the very end because like I said, it's got all these analog switches on the K2s that I really wanna play with because it's been years since I've done a passive system with these crossovers and I remember years ago when we did one, we had some amazing results by making those adjustments, which means we're gonna do that today. I'm gonna to shut this up, hop inside, let's listen to some stuff. With balance and fader and polarity checked, I know everything is where it needs to be. The first thing I adjust on an aftermarket radio is the time alignment section. This is a Kenwood, which is really cool because it gives you level control for each channel as well as delay. It sets a little bit different than, let's say, a DSP. It's almost backwards in how it works, which I'm gonna show you. First thing I like to say is that Kenwood, as well as everyone else, has some presets, meaning you can set it for driver, you can set it for light, whatever. And they're not bad, and sometimes they actually work. And if they do, leave it alone. Let it do its thing, there's no reason to touch it. 
In this case, because it's a truck and it's so wide, it's not working out of the box, which is okay. We're going to do it manually. My practice for doing it manually is to fade it all the way to the front first. I'm going to play polarity pops, and I'm gonna listen for the pop to move across the dash until it seems like it's in the center. I'm gonna fade it to the rear, and I'm gonna repeat the process, looking forward until it sounds like the pop is coming from between the two seats. And then I'll fade it back to the middle and listen to it again and make some minor adjustments if I need to. You can use level control control as well. So once you get it to where you think it is, you start playing music and you're like, man, it's a little off. I can use level control to turn certain things down if I'd like to. This is a quick and easy way to set it up without busting out the tape measure and all that for, for just a radio, which sometimes the tape measure really doesn't make sense in these because it is backwards and you usually get it wrong. Let's get started. I'm gonna start by adding distance to the front right. You'll notice it's gonna be adding milliseconds of delay to the left front as well as all the other speakers. Fade it to the rear once you have what you think is the best, and then start adding to the passenger rear. In this case, I adjusted the level on the rear passenger door because that tweeter is so close to me and it's kind of messing with the mid base, which is causing me to add way more delay than is actually necessary. Because when you look at these feet, they, they should be similar to what it is in real life. When you're happy, go back to your fader, put it in the center, see how it sounds and make minor adjustments if needed. Once I have it, how I feel it sounds the best, I'm gonna play the left, center, right. I get these tracks from the Sheffield Labs My Disc. That one does have copyright on it though, so you'll just have to go to your My Disc Sheffield Labs and you can take a listen to it. In the center of- In that track, what you're listening for is the female voice should sound like she's coming from the center area of your dash. Left and right are coming from their corresponding corners. So if you feel like you have it the way it needs to be, but she's still off a little bit, go into level and adjust the level. The other thing that's nice about this Kenwood is you can see it has these tweeter adjustments. Sometimes the tweeters are a little too hot. You can go in and turn them down here. It's a really nice feature when fine tuning to get delay, especially with a passive system. And that's the fun part of setting the alignment. The next part is the actual EQ. For that, we use pink noise. We get that from Educar's Test and Tune app on the iPhone. The Test and Tune app is pretty awesome. That's Educar Test and Tune. You can find it in the app store. It has an unlimited amount of pink noise. So when you're tuning a car for two hours, it just plays for two hours. It's wonderful. It also has test tones, which come in very handy. So it has the 40, the 1000, it has two others, a mid bass and a mid range. And they're all selected between zero, negative five, negative 10. It's very helpful. We're gonna be using the iTest mic with an older iPad. However, if you have a newer iPad, the U-Test mic is cheaper and comes with a longer cable. Very awesome. You can get them through Audio Control or Studio 6. There's links to them in DNF tool drawer, by the way. Play the pink noise. We'll go to the EQ page. If you notice right now, there is no low end because the subwoofer is off. I can add that in as needed. I'm more concentrating on this portion of the RCA here. And looking at it, I'm missing out on some tweeter, which I can make an adjustment on the passives, I'm gonna do that to fix it before I start playing with my EQ. That's a little better. When you get done playing with the EQ and you kind of have an idea of the visual aspect of it, it's okay to use your ears at this point. And what I like to do is select memory, make a preset, and now I'm gonna AB between flat and this and all the others on the radio and see what adjustments I might need to make to this so that I have a reference for what is sounding good and sounding bad. These adjustments look good on that, but they don't necessarily sound the best. For that, I'm gonna play some music, which is all gonna be not DRM free. So play some of your music and do the same thing. And that, as they say, is that. This one is done. Fernando, what do you think? I like it. I like it. This 911 is over. We fixed the problems. We put it back together after we took it apart and put it back together again. Yeah, there's a lot of taking apart and putting back together in a 911. As you've seen in this video, there's it's a lot of pre-work and then the actual work can start. And in this case, it's all pretty. It's all back together. Everything is the way it should be. The world is right once more. Yay! Fernando. On to the next one, guys. You guys have a great night as always. We hope you enjoyed this. Don't forget to like, subscribe, do all that fun YouTube stuff that you're supposed to do while here. See you later.
Bye, guys. Good night. Go. Be gone. We're tired, man. It's been a long <laughs> couple days.